Another 18XX, in this case 1824 Austria Hungary uh, Railways. It's kind of funny the story behind this. I bought it used. Um, I had had an eye out for it for a while. I saw a copy come up that was slightly damaged uh, at a price I was willing to pay. This was one that I wasn't sure I was going to like because it's not, you know, known as one of the big economic manipulation games. Now, um, but on the other hand, I'm kind of a slut for 18xx no matter what. And <laughs> I, you know, I'll pick any up if it's cheap enough. But, you know, this was one that I was interested in enough because it had different types of railways, different types of companies starting. Um... So I wanted to see how it was going to handle that kind of stuff. And it was also well regarded by people whose opinion, you know, uh, I respect, but more than that, that seems to align with mine a little bit. Uh, I don't know which way to put it. You know, I mean, it's like I should respect everyone's opinion, right? Yeah, well, if it doesn't align with mine, I guess I really don't. But that's something different, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I thought I might end up liking it. Um, and within like two days after I ordered it, a day after I ordered it, another copy showed up for like 20 bucks less without noting that it was in damaged condition. And I was just kicking myself about it, but that's okay. Um, because, uh, I mean, this is in pretty good shape. It's just the box had a little bit of damage to it and I paid a little bit more, but... Uh, I live. Um, so, one of the things about this one is that it is not. Uh, it is not one of those all kind of economic manipulation type things. It's sort of uh, more the opposite of an eighteen seventeen that I just did. Uh, but on the other hand, reading through the rules. I walked away with a, ooh, what the fuck? What's going on with this one? In part because the rules uh, are a little sloppy and sometimes a little obtuse. Or is it me that's obtuse? Um, but also, there are some very, very different concepts at play here. Uh, that maybe, yeah, in terms of mechanically, um, understanding them. They're not as complex as what's in 1817, but in terms of what the impact on play is going to be, they really are intensive. Now, uh, I realized enough about what I'm looking at to be able to say, well, I don't understand this enough. I want to at least play a little bit. I ended up playing a full game of it, and I hope I learned some things. I made a couple mistakes during that game. Um, the kind of stuff around phase changes because this is a game where the six train doesn't bring out the gray tiles it's the eight i think and that always confuses me when that happens because i'm used to the sixes bringing out the grays where sixes exist it makes more sense to have it on the eight uh let's talk about what we got the game holds up to six it's actually got several variants um it's got this Goods Time, which I, I have not tried, but it adds a lot more doinkers to the map. Um, that's particularly important. Now, if you think about most games of XX, doinkers, the little towns or whatever you want to call them, are generally a bad thing. But in this game, they serve a very peculiar purpose that makes um, players be fighting, uh, end up fighting each other over whether they want um, routes that go through them or routes that don't. And we'll touch on that because one of the things this focuses on is two different types of trains that have different desires. Then on the other side of the board, there's another map that's smaller for uh, to provide better two or three player games. Um, okay. What else do you have? Well, you know, this is second edition. I think the first edition probably came out through kind of a custom uh, print job, maybe through Deep Thought or something else. I don't know. But this is a Fox in Box, which I think I've gotten at least one other thing from. I really, they, they, they make, uh, you know, high quality, high quality stuff. Nice, thick, 
uh, track tokens. Uh, sometimes I feel like they're too thick. In, in some ways, I feel like this game maybe is a little overproduced. Not, not the track tokens necessarily, but they've got a duplicate on the other side. Do you really need that? I don't know. <laughs> Why? Um, uh, what else? Uh, well, one of the things that I've often mentioned is when you have big wooden pieces, I'm like missing my uh, regular counters in the game. You know, because when you're doing the stock market, flipping these guys over, they're harder to maneuver around. Um, this game produced basically two sets. One set of counters uh, to handle all the stock market uh, tokens and whatnot, and, and the uh, station tokens. But also a whole set of wooden pieces as well. And so everything is basically duplicated in it. And there's kind of a, huh. Um, I will be using the big wooden pieces, believe it or not, because there aren't a lot of companies in running in this game. This is a uh, two, four, six, eight company game. You see a lot more going on there. Don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, you have eight major companies in the game, but they come from what are essentially different kinds of minor companies uh, that are basically run by one player. They're not smaller corporations or anything like that. And then you also have these, which kind of are like privates, uh, which are just income generators. Um, everything generates a certificate, though. Uh, so, oh, I forgot something. You also have a bunch of trains, and you have two different kinds of trains in this game. Your regular trains, which work kind of like an 1830 train does. It counts everything it goes through. And then these uh, G trains, which mm, they're coal. I don't, I don't know what they're actually called, but they're for the coal mining uh, companies. Well, they're for transporting coal. And they work a little differently. They have to start in a coal mine. There are four of them on the map, each one associated with a coal company. And they don't count the doinkers, which means <laughs> that people who are running the G-trains will have a real incentive for, um, for trying to run the track through the boinker, through the, to the towns, I call them doinkers, um, and then the double the boinker doinkers and to collect as many of them as they can in a run. On the other hand, people who are running the normal trains have the normal uh, desire to avoid all of these little towns because for the most part, they're really shitty. And there's no way to, you know, like in 1856 to change towns into cities or anything like that. Uh, you got your share price index there. You got, like I said, a bunch of privates. You also have the normal corporate certificates this game actually comes with a big wad of play money. I, I'm so uh, so sold on using uh, the chips that again, I like it to be in a game though. So, uh, what what if you go someplace where there are no chips? Um, other special things about it: it has a fixed bank that can break. Uh, trying to think of anything else. My overall impression of this one from my play is that initial decisions are really, really important and they're kind of hard to disentangle. Uh, you have, uh, it has something of the flavor of an 1835 type game, which is to say um, you have a set, you know, of purchases initially, these miners, uh, that your choices among them really, really drive what the game's gonna be like uh, across the board, but you have a little bit more choice than you do in 35. Well, a lot more choice. Uh, they don't all have to come out. Um, they're not gonna hold up the purchase of real stocks, but you actually can't buy the real stocks for the most part, um, other than this, 
one railroad here, and, and you actually have multiple different types of major, you have two different types of major railroads. You have, uh, these are regional, which are derived from, sorry, got it wrong. These are regional, as is this, which are derived from the coal mining companies and are smaller corporations. And then these are the state-owned railroads, which are derived from these pre-state railroads up here. I, wrong way. <laughs> the pre-state railroads are these little number chits. These are the shares for the state railroads. But there are shares that are reserved based on the ownership of uh, various things that will collide into these companies. Okay. Um, you have an income track to keep track of uh, how much income each company runs. Operating rounds, much like 1830, uh, based on the... Uh, you have a variable number of operating rounds based on the train that's out. The game has a lot of iconography on it that I have a real hard time making hair, hide or hair of. Uh, luckily, you don't actually need any of that. Um, it also came with a German rule book. Um, oh, that one of the variants, the Goods Times <laughs> variant. Comes with a bunch of extra tiles. Basically, it's supporting more doinkers on the board. Um, again, I haven't explored the main game well enough to feel like I really want to look into the, the variant instead at this point. Although it might be more interesting, I found um, the competition between the two rail, uh, types of rails to be particularly interesting. And I feel like if you put more emphasis on the mining railways, uh, that balance and that hard decision making would become more and more difficult. Uh, what else? So this is a game from what I got out of it, where at least the first time where, um, again, there's not a lot of economic manipulation. There aren't a lot of corporations and you don't really feel like you can dump one and eat with ease. You know? <laughs> they seem pretty important. Uh, it's possible something's not very valuable in a shitty location. It's quite possible it'll be in a shitty location depending on what you do. I had a couple of companies, these guys, uh, starting out from the coal mines that just did not ever become... They made tons of money as coal mining companies back when they were in this state. And then when they shifted over, they were far inferior uh, to the ones that shifted over a little earlier. Some of that has to do with the choice of price that you start a company at. You have an option of different prices to start these guys at. Nothing else in the game, well, none of the other miners have any option as to the price that you can set them at. Uh, and, you know, assuming all the presidencies, etc. well, assuming that all the coal mining companies are sold out, basically you have no option as to the prices of other companies. This is the only exception. That company can be floated at any price. Now, if a coal mining company doesn't sell out, it is possible to... Uh, um, to have more companies in that same status, mm -hmm. where uh, they're regional companies that don't have a fixed uh, starting value. I need to take a little bit of a break. I'll be back in a moment. I had to look up and I screwed up in my play. Um, when I read the rules, it says uh, first stock round, blah, 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 not much. The player order in this initial purchase phase is determined by the seating order. The first turn goes into sending order. See example at left. You just keep going. Okay, well, nothing sounds amazing there, so I just skip over it. Well, example of left is absolutely important to the rules. First turn in first share round counterclockwise. Uh, player order in five player game. Five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Um, this is... It, it, doesn't, it doesn't sink in right away. You know, this is the kind of shorthand... Um, that the rules often use, and then 
uh, direct you, you know, maybe to the sidebar or maybe have an asterisk that directs you to the sidebar about some special case or something, it is difficult for me to cope with. Um, in particular, what it means is that the person who has the first player priority does not get the first pick among the companies, and this is important. But basically what happens is the first time around it starts and realize I go uh, counterclockwise as my base. So it starts here with player six, works its way around and works back up to one, but then one goes. And then from then on, the rest of the game is always going to be, well, in my case, counterclockwise, but normally it would be clockwise. You would be following whatever your normal agreed, you know, standard seating order is. Okay. I wanted to make sure of that as well as deal with some, uh, Seems like I have another round of uh, COVID, or another two rounds of it recently, <laughs> which me it it just feels like the same shit. So I'm assuming I have gotten it again. My wife also has been showing the same signs, and they're different signs from each other. So it's just weird. We're having the same illness we had earlier in the year started back up. Um, okay. So what's there to talk about? Let's talk about the different kinds of railway. So the mountain railways, um, the purchase price, I'm sorry, these are the mountain railways. The purchase price of these is 120 guilders and they produce 25 guilders at the beginning, you know, we'll call them bucks, whatever, at the beginning of each operating round. When the first three train comes out, during your stock round, you can trade these in for a share of the of the stocks listed here, which are all of the regional companies. Um, when the four train comes out, you're forced to exchange it. Um, they're not sold to companies or to corporations. They're just something you hold and they produce some income. They're kind of nice. At the beginning of the game, they produce you very good income, uh, but they don't get you any stock appreciation, although they do get you a share, which will have stock appreciation already baked in, possibly. You get your choice of share that you want to take, assuming it's available. You can't take any of the reserved shares. There's no reservation on these. If all of them are taken, uh, you can't trade in for anything useful. <laughs> Okay, these are the coal railways. Uh, the coal railways each exchange for a directorship in one of the regional companies at certain points. Now you can see here, you can start, and this is the iconography in these, you can start um, exchanging with the first three train and you are forced into an exchange when the five train happens. These exchanges generally happen during the stock round unless they're the forced exchanges. Um, okay, let me talk about how the privates are handled, because I was worrying about, in terms of the initial um, dispatch of the auction, uh, of the initial packet or whatever. The initial packet is it's everything, but there are actually six of these, and you use different numbers based on different number of players. Um, in the five player game, you would be using all six. In the six player game, which I'm gonna do, you use only four of them. Uh, okay, so starting with the person who is furthest from priority, <laughs> working backwards to begin with, and then you'll be working forwards every other time through. Uh, you get an option to buy any one of these. Your choice, you just buy it. You put down the cash you wanna put down for it, or that you must put down for it, and the next player gets to go. <laughs> very, very simple. No, no problems with bidding, auctioning, no, no complicated stuff here. That seems like a very, very powerful capability. The fact that it does this reverse snake or whatever at least once means that whoever gets that first option um, probably has something of an advantage, but the priority gets a double turn, so that might kind of work out in its, you know, to balance that off. And other players are able to, you know, they get kind of a balanced choice between 
maybe maybe not the best uh, you know so <laughs> if there were a clear delineation of which one was best and, and which one was worst you could probably say that's pretty balanced um of course there's not such a delineation <laughs> if there were it wouldn't be as interesting a game probably it would always play out a certain way it does not <laughs> um I say after one play solo, solo. yeah. Trust me, I know. Um, okay, uh, the coal railways, let's go back to these. So when you buy one of these, when you, when you pick one of these at that initial, uh, auction, uh, initial packet sales, you may pay any of these listed amounts, 120 to 200 um, guilders. Half of that amount becomes the starting value of the company, of the underlying, uh, of the eventual um, regional railway. The amount of capital, uh, the amount of cash that you, you paid goes into your company treasury. This is a big deal. Just like in the initial company treasuries in 1835, sometimes you want to pay um, not the minimum. <laughs> In particular, what I found was, let's see, the companies that paid the minimum had trouble, they, they made good money. They made great returns on their investment, but they had trouble, um, and I'm not sure those were the, yeah, they were. Um, they had trouble turning um, into their, regional railway properly. They also had certain advantages that kept them in the game, game too long, but the real thing had to do perhaps with the fact that they are sitting, um, the particular lo starting locations of those two corporations, uh, of those two regional corporations is kind of not where they want it to go. <laughs> this one really wanted to go through all these dots. This one wanted to connect up to all the dots over here. Uh, and that kind of had an impact on things. Live and learn. Okay. Um, these guys are able to hold two trains on them. When you first buy it, it has to pay 120 uh, of its initial money which might be all of its initial money if you only started it at 60, uh, paying 120 in, to buy a 1G train. What, a one train? Yeah, <laughs> it can hit one location and as many doinks for free uh, as it wishes. And the coal thing is not a regular location that generates revenue in a different sort of way. Um, so in particular, the coal railways use the coal rules, which are the company gets the value here in its treasury, and then um, payouts are based on what their run is on the rest of the board. In the case of both the coal companies and the pre-state railroads, uh, you split that 50-50 no matter what. So they're like miners in other games. <laughs> it is possible for other players to buy shares in these regional companies. Assuming that the price has been set by buying the coal company. If no one bought the coal company, or if no one buys any of the, if any private, uh, well, if any of the initial packet remain after that first stock round, they're all swept away and gone. And the coal companies, uh, the, the regionals that come from coal companies are just turned into something similar to this, which is available for purchase. Uh, It's a little less uh, well described from what I can see. 
as to what happens with the state uh, the the minor the pre-state railways but as far as i can tell what happens is if you don't buy the president the the pre-state that owns the pre that controls the president's share or director's share that director's share is now available for someone to purchase immediately and they always have a fixed price of 120 no matter what uh, so these pre-state railways are like pieces of the Prussian in 1835, but there's three different uh, railways. One that starts here, one that starts here, and one that starts here. And um, out of each of the three companies, one of them is in charge of the director's share, and that'll be worth 240 guilders initial money. The others are worth 120 and are in charge of, uh, and provide an additional, a different share. Again, if they're not purchased, these pre-states don't start and the shares become available uh, to the normal sh uh, state company. When you're running what I'm going to call the miners, which is the coal in the pre-states, they don't affect any stock value. They just split their money. They split uh, whatever uh, train run they get 50 50 between the owner and the corporation or the company. Once you get to major corporations, they work like you're used to in most XX games, which is. Uh, say <laughs> yeah there's an option to pay out and uh, the proportion of the payout goes to the people who have shares this is a game that has very simple you either pay out or you don't uh, much like 1830 or most of the earlier ones um Trying to see if there's anything I really want to deal over here. Starting capital for the major corporations is going to be the number of shares that weren't reserved uh, times the starting share price. So if it's one of the state bonds, they get 120 per share. And, mm, you know, most of them have three shares outstanding, so it's seven times 120 is going to be added to whatever they collect from um, their component parts. With the regionals, they have 80% outstanding um, times whatever price was chosen for them. Remember, the initial purchaser gets that choice. Finally, for this one and any other regionals uh, that no one, uh, no one bought the coal company for, and therefore it got discarded at the beginning of the game, uh, the person buying the presidency, the directorship, gets to pick any price between uh, any of the gold prices between 160 and they will get 10 times that value, the full, oh, full capitalization. <laughs> uh, special rules for the first stock round. You may not sell any shares. Um, you are allowed to buy, in that first stock round, shares that are not, you know, <laughs> that are not part of this initial packet. In particular, what might you want to buy? Well, if a price is set, you can buy individual shares of stuff. That's probably a bad idea if uh, the associated, you know, if the corporation is not going to start. So, for example, before uh, turn before the three trains come out, these guys cannot start. Before the four trains come out, 
or the five trains or the six trains, depending on the company, these are not going to start. So none of those are good purchases. However, this could start at any point. So someone could decide to just float that sucker um, instead of buying the miners. I think that's probably a really horrible idea, but <laughs> and I'm not certain. I did not try it out and probably won't in this play either. It doesn't look good because its starting location is a 10-point city, and there isn't a lot going on down here. There isn't a mountain. Uh, there isn't a coal mine near it. There's just nothing to really um, uh, to recommend starting that sucker. But whatever. Uh, most of this stuff is 18xx stuff. Um, you can't sell anything in the first share round. You can't sell uh, shares of a company that has not operated it yet and you can't sell if 50 percent of the company is in the bank there's no bank pool in this game all the uh, company shares are tracked here and so again you don't want to buy stuff that's not going to run you can't even get rid of it then um, just as a a kind of thought. The game allows you to do some really, really bad choices. Okay. Uh, do I want to talk about anything about operating rounds? Ah, oh, shit. I screwed up in many ways. So this looks like three operating rounds happens on the brown train, but here it says if the six train has been sold. I got my familiarity with... Uh, Okay, so this is interesting. Yeah, it doesn't even specify here. Yeah, that's not nice. Oh no, here it is. There are three operating rounds after your stock run. Okay. Yeah, and that's on the six. Um, so I screwed up a lot of shit uh, having to do. <laughs> I screwed up just about everything having to do with the differentiation between the five and the six train in this game. Uh, and I hope I'll do better this time. Um, operating round, what is special here? Boop, 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 ah. So again, the variable operating rounds. We'll look at that when we look at the phase changes. Uh, Coal mines count as revenue locations. I gotta be careful about that and make sure that they make sense. Uh, okay. Only G trains can go to coal mines. These are the special thing in their game. Their route must not end in a different coal mine. You can only go, you, you can only include one coal mine in your route and you have to go somewhere else. Um, coal mines never count against the range of the G train. So the 1G gets to go somewhere. Uh, in the early stages of the game, you use the lower printed value of the mine's hex. And then after the sale, this is what's weird. After the sale of the first five train, you use the higher one. I actually screwed that up in the other direction <laughs> where I didn't notice it, uh, the change until late. The company itself gets the cash. Whatever company is running to that coal mine gets the money for um, for that directly in its treasury. This is a big deal. It's a way to get cash into your treasury without having to do the full swallow, the only other way you can get cash in your treasury. I've seen some games that have other ways to get uh, cash in your treasury other than swallowing, but those usually include like the half swallow. Um, this has the traditional stock market and no, no half swallows. Um, okay, coal station, uh, coal corporations, or what are companies, uh, get a token on their coal mine. There's the right one for that. And that's the only token they have on the map. They have three tokens. I'm not sure why they have three. There's different things you can do with it. I'll be using it as sort of a track over on the price chart, but there are issues with that as well. Uh, okay, the order in an operating round. The first thing that happens is all the mountain railways pay out their uh, dividend, 25 bucks to the owner. Then each of the coal mine operate, or coal companies operate in their order, one through four. 
Then the pre-stats bond operate one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Um, and unfortunately, uh, there are not three tokens for each of these. <laughs> there are only two for each, enough to keep track of how much money it made and its dot on the map. The coal mining companies, you could say, kind of don't really need a dot on the map, but okay. It helps as a reminder that they're in operation or whatever. And then the major corporations will get to run in their share price order, and this follows pretty much the 1830 policy. Uh, highest value goes first, uh, furthest to the right among um, boxes with the same value, and if you're all in the same box, whoever's got there first goes before whoever got there later. All right, I gotta swap batteries. I haven't mentioned it yet. Like in 1817, um, this is not a good starting 18XX. Uh, don't, don't hunt this one down as your first XX. Uh, and in terms of my coverage, I absolutely am not trying to explain it for non-XX players. Uh, I may be saying more than you want if you're an XX player. Probably always saying more than people want, but... Um, uh, and certainly less effectively than you might want. But yeah, the, the, you, do not want, uh, you do not want to start with this. And if you want to get uh, an overview of XX type games, take a look at, uh, I think either, I know my 1831, I went through uh, the rules to some extent, but I think I did the same in 18AL, uh, which I also covered. And <laughs> we'll never play again, even though I print and blade it. Oh, which is more work than buying something, right? Okay. Oh, what do we got going on here? Mm, your order of play is pretty standard. Uh, you're allowed to lay one track tile, uh, one station marker. You can run your, you must run your trains. Uh, and then you're allowed, uh, yeah, you must buy a train if you're missing one with any company. And uh, there is actually a sort of a hint. I'm told that this is some kind of remnant from a, uh, a prototype version of the game, where it looks like you're allowed to lay two two yellow tracks, but there's nothing else supporting that in the game. Um, otherwise, in general, it follows standard XX rules there and spells them out to a large degree. Mm. Looking to see if there's anything terribly exciting here. Okay, your stations, it's like uh, 1830 uh, for the major companies. Your first, oh yeah. It, it's a little weird because the pre-state uh, railways turn into something uh, that may have multiple dots on the board already. But your first dot is essentially a free one. Your second one costs 40. Each additional one that you're allowed costs 100. Um, but other than this state railway, the others have multiple locations. So they're $40 dot and in this case, one of their $100 dots has actually already been used uh, in the creation of the company. But that's uh, just how they work. There are no extra dots for any of the miners. They have just their single dot to begin with. Uh, operating trains. Uh, normal stuff there. You can't run over the same track. I saw one where you could. I played one recently where you could. That was so confusing. But I think they were different types of trains again. Uh, but it, it was the recent uh, one I did by GMT. And I can't rem remember the name. Like maybe 42 or something like that. I, I don't know what the hell it was. Uh, so G trains are the only thing that start at mines. And they must start in a mine. 
and they must only hit one mine. <laughs> now, the biggie here is normal trains work like they normally do in XX. They count every location they hit. Red area, uh, dots, well, towns, cities, whatever. You cannot... Uh, so, the game goes out of its way to say that you can hit two locations in the same hex as long as you're running on different track. Uh, but, <laughs> you can't hit Vienna or Budapest twice. Well, those are the only big cities that have, you know, two dots on them. But, <laughs> there are double doinkers. And the double doinkers um, work like they do in 1830 where you have actually fixed non-upgradable track that you could run through and back through. There's nothing like an ooh, -ooh in this game. Um, and there's nothing like New York City is in 1830. Uh, Vienna and Budapest are considered singular cities that have these difficult to arrange initial uh, places. Um, oh, and of particular note, it's kind of important to look at the special pieces. So, Vienna turns into this on the green tile. And this is particularly interesting because, hey look, two of these zoom out, you know, like this, but this one actually bridges it, and that makes it, um, that makes this location kind of interesting because it can actually hit um, another city right away, which the others aren't really gaining much that you wouldn't expect. And then on the brown, it turns into this, which can either go like this or like this, depending on which way you divide, whoever plays it wants it, which, you know, cuts one piece of Vienna off across the river. Very, very weird. Um, giving some importance to control of that. I don't think there's anything equally interesting about Budapest. Uh, it immediately turns into one of these. It does end up uh, gaining another space on it. Uh, and you can see Vienna sticks at four and just collapses into itself up to gray. And uh, Budapest, I think, goes to four only on the gray, right? Yeah, or it goes to three on the gray. And it looks like there's only one gray T. Uh, so there's these T spaces and Looks like only one of them is upgradable to that 60. That's interesting. Did they tell us this? Yep. Yep. I thought there were more. Okay. Um, so the big deal with the G train is they only count large cities uh, against however many times, uh, you know, however many cities they can pass through. But for score, for their revenue, they get the extra bonuses for all those little doinkers. So, like I was alluding to early in the game, you want to hit all kinds of doinkers when you're running these call trains. And you can make some ridiculously large revenues because there are a fair number of dots on here. And I assume the good times <laughs> um, scenario gives you an even bigger uh, set Give, gives you even bigger runs off those coal trains and makes them very appealing. Now, the coal companies aren't the only ones who can buy coal trains. Any company can buy them. And in fact, the coal companies aren't restricted to coal trains. <laughs> they can buy other kinds of trains. Um, they probably don't want one because while they're coal companies, they can they must uh, include a coal the the coal space. Um, they could basically run you know two trains, one out of each space. Uh, that they have, they all have two two exits, and nothing but a coal train can run there. So, even though they can own a different type of train, they don't particularly want it unless you're trying to shift trains around. But the real companies have every reason in the world to want coal trains, and in fact, eventually these guys are gone, and only real companies are around, and they'll be making big money off of those coal runs that were set up early in the game. Um, okay. So, when you're running a miner, like I said, the money gets split 50-50. When you're running um, a corporation, well, 
and in both cases, this is sans any special money coming from hitting, running a coal train, which immediately drops in the company treasury no matter what. And remember, this doesn't count against uh, the coal train either. Um, so you figure out your revenue amount and you pay it out. And it either all goes out um, as dividends or all goes into the company treasury. And unlike 1830, shares here, there is no bank pool, um, don't pay into the company. There's no way to get money into your company other than full swallows or running to the coal companies. Ah, uh, trains. <laughs> you could buy a train off another company. Okay. Speaking of trains, every company must have a train at all times. And the director of the company is responsible for the train if they have to pay, if they have to buy it. Um, I want to look at what the restrictions are. Yeah. On emergency financing. Um, several different trains are available. You get to choose which to buy. Yeah. So, so this is kind of interesting. Um, if you must buy a train, um, you're not forced to buy it from here. You could buy it from another company. You could buy it from another company, even if you don't have enough cash to buy it from that company, that company's offering price, but you're not forced to buy a train that another company offers up either which is kind of interesting. Um, okay. The train manifest and how this works. So at the beginning of the game, a bunch of these are sold. Four of these, up to four of them, are already in play. There's only six, so there might be two more available. But you can't buy them <laughs> unless you're a coal company that just started. And then you, just as soon as you're bought in that initial option, you buy one. But otherwise, you're not allowed to buy any of these. And they're fairly cheap at 120 um, until somebody buys the first two train. And we'll talk about the full of the phase changes, but one of the things is, as the phase changes on the main trains, the corresponding G train becomes available. But the G trains wipe each other out. So you could actually run all the way through all the main trains and never um, buy big enough G trains to wipe out the ones even, presumably. That's not gonna happen, but it's possible. Um, you can't do that with the G trains because they're limited by the, the normal numeric trains in terms of being available. You can have a train that you're not able to run, and that's perfectly fine. You will not operate, and that's too bad, but you got a train, you're fine. <laughs> Nobody said you had to use it. Actually, you do have to use it if you can, but that's different. Um, nobody said you had to buy something useful. Uh, you can buy from other companies. Now, if you buy from another company that you own, you can set the price at whatever you like. If you buy from another company that someone else owns, and I don't like this rule, I know the reason behind it, you have to pay face value. Uh, the reason is to prevent kingmaker type events. Um, I have never seen one of those. I have, uh, I have never seen players in an 18xx game trying to play kingmaker in that way. Um, I have seen players have, and, and, and okay, I'm assuming the reason is to prevent king making opportunities. I have seen players make judgments that a train was worth some amount, uh, less or more than it was really worth uh, to both players, you know, <laughs> that, that, that the deal was a fair deal um, because it allowed certain things to happen. I have seen trains change hands in order um, to create game-induced events. Uh, I have never seen someone say, well, so-and-so screwed me over, 
or I really like so-and-so, so I'm going to hand them a train. And that's kind of the why I don't like this rule is it takes away some, some flexibility that I believe is actually of interest in the game for something that, I don't know, I've just never seen players who play XX get that way about, you dotted me out, that's it, I'm going to sell my permanent train to, to Johnny. <laughs> and then he's going to bury you. No, <laughs> I just have not seen that kind of play. Um, and I suspect it's got something to do with the kind of people who play XX, maybe. I, very competitive, but uh, just not, you know, not in that. Well, that's it. I'm going to screw you over for the rest of the game time. Actually, no, I have seen somebody who's tried doing that. But he hates XX. <laughs> so there you go. Okay. Um... What about emergency financing? Well, if you have to buy a train and you don't have the money to buy the train that you want to buy, <laughs> you're allowed to dig into your own pocket. You're, you have to spend everything out of the treasury and then you're allowed to pull it out of your own pocket. If you don't have enough money in your pocket, you don't have to sell shares. You can if you want to. You, but you could also take out a loan. And from what I can tell, it's not well spelled out here. Uh, when you take out a loan, you immediately add 50% to that loan as interest. And I'll be using these little googly eyes. These are extra towns for the good times uh, <laughs> expansion um, or variant. I'll be using those to differentiate between money that's uh, actual money and borrowed money. Um, and then as far as I can tell, whatever cash you get pays off that loan. It doesn't specify it, but you're not allowed, you're, you're allowed to keep it a loan for as long as you like. Um, each time that a stock round ends, if you have not cleared that loan yet, uh, you pay 50% interest again. <laughs> And you're not allowed to buy any shares until you are debt-free. So I, it's not a state you want to keep yourself in, I don't think. Um, but it prevents you from having to lose valuable shares that are going to produce you a lot of money over the course of, say, three operating rounds just because you were a couple dollars short, you know, on your train purchase uh, because something didn't run in time or whatever. And then it's clearly worth paying a few extra bucks uh, in interest. And that could be a, a fair amount of interest that's still well worth holding on to shares for a while. Um, okay. Uh, you're allowed to buy trains from the market using a, a, a partial exchange. If you have the immediate preceding train to the one that you want to purchase, you get your train for less than yeah, you would normally get. So for example, a four train costs 280. Well, it only costs 190 if you turn in a three train. And the bonus is always half the price of the prior train. It kind of took me a while to figure out what the hell they're talking about with this, and I had to look on a thread about many things in this game. So the 280 here minus the 90 is 190, and they just all work out that way. It has to be the immediately preceding type of train. Um, you can only trade in one train. You can only part exchange one train for each train purchase that you make. You can't say, I'll trade two threes in to get 90 bucks off for each. Um, okay, let's look at the different phases in particular to see what goes on with them. So yellow tiles, two trains, one operating round after each stock round. The first two trains, this is phase one, before any trains have been purchased. All there are is one G's on any of these that have been purchased. Uh, the first two train comes in, you enter phase two. The one G becomes available. And at the end of each set of operating rounds, a train gets exported. Um, the normal train 
the next normal train gets removed from the game, and this can cause a phase change, of course. This prevents the game from stagnating. Um, I, you know, a lot of recent games have been going with train exports. My feeling with them is, yeah, there have been a couple of games where train exports are really necessary. Uh, but it feels a little sloppy to me. Like, it's like, sure, 1870 needed them. Um, maybe this game does too, but if it does, it's because they put extra trains in because of train exports. Uh, it makes the, the train rushes a little too rushed to me. Um, I kind of like the players controlling that a little more. And other than 1870 and 2038, two games which never proceed beyond a certain point without somebody taking a hit, basically, to bring out the next train, um, I don't feel like train, like train exportation is really necessary. Now, again, I haven't played any of the games that have train export without it, but <laughs> because my thinking is, well, they've probably been designed with these extra trains in there so that they, uh, there's no longer this, this care taken to make sure that the game will probably bring out all the trains. Um, I feel like this game... Players are really, in, in part because of the trade-ins, players are really pushing trains out really hard. Uh, though I did get to a point where maybe the 10 train would not have come out. But I'd rather that be the player's choice than force it by the game mechanism. And that's, you know, just my taste. And I, I, again, I don't know how this would work without the train export. But it's a design element that's been cropping up in all the recent XX games I keep seeing. And I'm just like, eh, I'm getting kind of sick of it, you know. <laughs> it's a way to fix a couple badly broken games rather than something that I think should be the standard. Okay, but anyway. Uh, first three train brings green into play. The two Gs, always the corresponding G comes in. Uh, you can start exchanging coal railways, mountain railways. Uh, there are two operating rounds. And companies are now allowed to buy trains from each other. Just like in 1830, you can't do it right off the bat because you could overpower a company right away. Um, the first four train kills the twos. Three Gs become available. When the first three G is bought, it'll kill a one G. Uh, mountain railways are closed. And that's specified on here with that little four bang. Um, the train limit for regional railways changes. The Sudabon automatically is founded. It has no option at the end of the operating round. These exchange and collapse into it. The presidency is determined by whoever holds shares. And remember, that's not necessarily just these four shares. People could have bought shares of it at $120 each, knowing that it's going to collapse soon, knowing that it's going to make money or they want to control it or whatever. Okay. Uh, first five train. Brown tiles become available. Coal railways are closed. Um, they fall into the regional railways. The G trains will start producing larger amounts of money for the company treasury. And... Uh, the Budapest Railroad is formed, again collapsing the two proto-rails into it. Uh, the first six train, three trains scrapped, the 2G and 1G, if not happened previously, are scrapped when the first 4G is bought. So it would be possible to skip buying a 3G and a 4G ends up killing both the ones and twos. An interesting observation there. Uh, 4Gs become available. The third of the state railways is collapsed into each other here in Vienna. Uh, we got two different types of train limits. They're specified on the different cards. In here. So this only exists after the six, so it doesn't tell you all the different types. Um, but the black train, this is one of uh, the locals or regionals. 
and it's actually smaller. Let me see if I can find another. Here's another. So these would make a good comparison. So when the five train is out, uh, this makes it only holds three trains. This holds four, and then yeah, for the end of the game, the state railways hold an extra train. We're going to need to swap batteries and go take care of some toiletry. Toiletry. Okay. Um, well, we kind of stopped in the middle of things here. Uh, why? I don't know. Uh, the first eight train. Gray tiles become available. Now notice, no new train, no new tiles come in with the six. Gray tiles come in with the eight. The four trains are scrapped and 5G is available. That will scrap the 3G and anything earlier uh, you don't add, again the same disclaimer works there except here's the thing um somebody's gonna buy a 4g it's a permanent train <laughs> now <laughs> you can make a really really nice forerun now you'll notice coal train is more expensive coal train is more expensive coal train is more expensive but now they're evening out. Mm. It's more expensive on trade-in, but that's because the 3G is cheaper than the 5. Um, they're evening out there, and that's because the 4 and 5G, what you're really buying there is the permanence. Um, yes, you can run through Vienna and Budapest and make lots of money with them, as well as hitting... Uh, as well as hitting your coal route. But what I found is a lot of the companies that were using them were finding it difficult um, to go through. Basically, you were set up uh, better for the coal route or better for your the rich route in the cities here. And we'll see. <laughs> there were companies who were doing both. <laughs> but... Um, if you're set up well for the coal route, there's a good chance that you're not, you know, you're not running through some of the richer areas of the board. Uh, I'm not sure that really uh, applies all that much. I think the 4G and 5G are worth well more than uh, the 6 or 8 train from what I've seen of them. But I don't know. I, I, I definitely saw the 8 train making about as much as a 5G. You know, uh, but again, that may be particular to the game that I was playing. And then when the 10 train comes out, the five trains are scrapped. And the 3G and less die here no matter what. Even if you have not bought those G trains, uh, the four and five there. I would not take it. So here it says 5G trains are available. The 3G are scrapped when the first 5G is bought. Um, I would not take the omission of the 1 and 2Gs uh, <laughs> as law, but if you play with people who want things to be absolutely explicit, well, this is not the game for them to play uh, because the rules are a little fuzzy in places. And two, yeah, I could see where they would say, okay, the 4G only kills the 3G, it will not kill one and two G's, and it's not like there have to be three G's out. The three G's coming out would have killed the one and twos, right? Uh, no, wait, the four G kills the two G, wait, what? What do I got here? When the first four G is bought, the five G, yeah, yeah, yeah. The five G, so if you skip the four G's, the 5G could allow the 1s and 2s to survive. If you read these rules explicitly and, you know, <laughs> I, I think that's incorrect. Um, and But no matter what, the 10 kills all the remaining G trains, no matter what. Okay. Exportation of trains. We talked about this here to indicate the players will find a cross-out locomotive. It's up here. Uh, Okay, it just takes the train out of play and triggers phase changes. Share price changes. Um, normally we would cover this uh, beforehand, but it's all in one place. Okay, so 
uh, if you pay a dividend, you move one to the right. If you don't pay a dividend, you move one to the left. If you hit these arrows, you go up or down. During the stock round, for each player who sells a collection, uh, who sells any shares of a given stock in one of their stock terms, the price goes down one space. Uh, if the shares are completely in players' hands at the end of the entire stock round, it goes up one space. Um, note this. It's not one space per share. It's not, uh, it's not only if the president sells. It's also um, possible the same person selling again will drive the price down again. So you could do it. This is an 1835 type uh, stock market, basically. The game ends when the bank breaks. It's $12,000. Um, and you win by having most value. Uh, there's no other way for the game to end. There's no bankruptcies in this game uh, because you can keep taking debt. <laughs> if you've managed to create a pathological situation for yourself, you could end up well below zero at the end of the game. Um, or you could have weird victory conditions like person closest to zero wins in your own mind. <laughs> Whatever. Um, without going below it. Because that could actually be a tricky thing to, to arrange. Um, it's kind of a cute, cute uh, thing. Uh, this game doesn't really feel like it's driven the way, say, 1817 is, in terms of like, oh, here are these economic mechanisms that are, you know, in play. <sighs> Honestly, um, the differentiation, and this is the biggest thing in the game, between the G trains and the, and the regular trains is a hard one to explain. Um, except that, like, these big freight coal running trains are better suited to hitting little doinkers. But why wouldn't they run on the sea? They, there's a lot of, eh, I'm not sure I understand. So, like, the game that allows the same, uh, the same kind of train, or different kinds of trains to run over the same track makes more sense to me than this does. But this, um, as a game, from what I've seen so far, is really, really kind of astounding. Um, it ends up, and, and part of it has to do with that segmentation that you can't run the same trains over the same track, <laughs> that makes this uh, particularly uh, difficult decision-making. Um, it, it really gives you these challenging decisions as to where you want to make your money, how you want to make it. And I feel like there's a lot of room for strategic thinking in this that uh, probably 1817 is the closest game to having that. But in terms of like the realism of what it's representing, um, unlike 1817, it doesn't feel like, and, and some others like uh, 1841 and whatnot, it doesn't feel like it's really trying to um, to improve, uh, to try to further revi refine the simulation value of 18xx. Now, the simulation value of 18xx is kind of low in some ways, but, you know, compared to a lot of economic <laughs> games, it does a, a better job than, than many. Unlike war games, uh, economic games tend to, to get kind of short, tended to get kind of short shift. Uh, you got things like Silverton and stuff that, that really try to handle details, but they don't handle the stock side of things. And the stock side of things was really interesting. That's why I got drawn into 18, uh, 18xx for the, for the most part. And then 1817 is sort of the pinnacle of that that I've seen uh, with the short sales and whatnot. Although uh, I always have disagreements with how an 18xx handles things uh, in terms of the accuracy of the representation. Here, I don't feel like the accuracy of the representation is a big deal. Um, this is more of a, hey, here's something really clever that, you know, works out to be a really, really enticing game. And I can't say that I'm disappointed about that. You know, <laughs> there's a part of me that's like, uh, I, I, 
want things to be realistic and everything. But somehow it's not bugging me that much. Whereas, uh, you know, um, I, I guess there's two kinds of two kinds of um, changes that are made to X to the base XX model. Is uh, one of them is the let's try to refine um, the economic model and try to make it more like the real world and you see stabs at that and 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 you can make arguments on either side so like 1830s model of capitalization versus 1856s model of capitalization you know versus 1817s for that matter um they they all have uh, different arguments in their favor and none of them are quite right but you can see what was trying to be done there you know and and he, here, though, it feels like the refinement, another kind of refinement that's done is, ah, oh, there's things that I don't like about many XX games. So here's one example. This is a game where you have a fixed uh, number of tracks. It's a pretty limited number, to tell you the truth. It feels like about the 1830, but the terrain is so open um, that actually you want more track for whatever reason. It's actually hard to get around things. There's a fair number of dots. There's a fair number of things like double doinkers that block stuff off that it's actually hard to get through. And, and then you have these long uh, sets of track and it's not like, there's nothing speeding up track lane. There's no two, two lanes with yellows or anything like that. Um, so for this fairly small board, it ends up um, kind of a tight competition. There's a lot of dots on the board. Uh, there's a lot of companies with a lot of dots. <laughs> so um, things become difficult to maneuver through. And when you get a limited number of old 1830 style, 29 for that matter, if I recall correctly, um, style tracks that you know limit your direction of flow, uh, it's very, very hard <laughs> to get what you want. And in a lot of cases, there's only one tile of a given type. In particular, there's very few of the brown tiles. Um, yeah. Anyway, what it works out to be is that uh, that kind of short, uh, the scarcity of, of particular tiles becomes a major factor in the game. Um, so does control of uh, the roots through the dotting. Um, and aggressive placement of, of tiles, etc. But here's another thing. So usually the refinement ones are trying to make the game simpler. Um, maybe make it not as difficult to get screwed. This is a game that really lets you get screwed hard, not just on the track side of things. Uh, you can manipulate uh, share values to some extent, but mainly you can manipulate the living shit out of the train uh, manifest. Um, you can really play with those. You can bring them out faster or slower. You have so much power over them. You're able to move them around between companies, which doesn't have much. What you're not really able to do, although you can rape a company and dump it, like in 1835, it doesn't look very appealing generally. Um, there's a small number of companies. Eight feels small. Oh, I think that's smaller than 1830. How many are in 1830? It's got to be more than eight. <laughs> I say, uh, I'm gonna have to think. Memory's telling me it's eight when I go through them. Um, why do they feel tighter here? Part of it may be the way you get them, uh, that you inherit them from something you've had. It's not like you're just, hmm, let me throw a thousand bucks, you know, let me throw five, six hundred bucks into this company and I'll just use it up and throw it somewhere. Um, I, I definitely, I, I was playing, when I was playing uh, my, my tr first run of it, I was playing it with the, I really don't want to hold two shares of a guy's company because he's got two companies and something horrible could happen. But on the other hand, I really did feel like it was hard to part with the companies. In part maybe because um, 
the consequences of a raped company don't seem as bad. Uh, on the other hand, there were a couple of companies that were really unattractive uh, in terms of their, their location on the board and what they had set up. So those would have been uh, probably good, uh, good opportunities to dump. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. All right. Uh, like I said, I was very pleasantly, I think I said, I was very pleasantly surprised with my first playthrough of this. Um, I had first been looking at it and saying, wow, I'm worried this is just a mess and I'm going to have a lot of trouble with it. And instead it really engaged me in a way that engineering style games generally don't. Um, this one feels a lot harsher than most of them that I've seen. Uh, the limitation of track that's a bit of a headache. Oh, another headache about this one, it drags at the end. A lot of XXs do, where there's not a lot going on. You're basically competing over, you know, very limited token and track fighting um, when the game's pretty much decided. Pretty early in the game, to tell you the truth. Uh, the decisions that you make here and how they play out initially, uh, I think, are really what decide the game. Now you could say that about any of them, like, oh, who ran for the most money early on? Yeah, uh, it's not that simple. <laughs> I definitely saw people who ran for the most money early on in this uh, not do anywhere near as well in the later part of the game. So there's some interesting factors there. And again, like with 1817, I think this is a rich enough subject this particular game that you know my second play or whatever isn't going to show you a hell of a lot of great insight um, i certainly don't feel you know like i'd be able to sit down with a table of people who've played this before a couple of times and uh, and and be ready to compete fully all right let's end it up